Howard will be sharing baked oatmeal. There won't be the French toast this week, or this next week rather, but it'll be baked oatmeal, thanks to Howard. So I would encourage all the men to come out. We usually have a 15, 20 minute time of fellowship and uh, looking into the word and encouragement, and Bruce is gonna provide that. And then after that, we have some open discussion among men, which is a really neat thing. Doesn't happen often enough. So I would encourage you to come out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> and uh, all ages uh, in terms of uh, men are welcome. So uh, I just again, uh, wanna underscore this invitation to come join us. Uh, other announcements? Anyone? Yes. Can you uh, bring I'm this up? A, okay. Um, there is a copy of the practice of the presence um, by Brother Lawrence out on the back table by the um, the clipboard for um, the video. So Pastor referenced that about three or four weeks ago, mm -hmm. and it was borrowed. And if anyone else would like to borrow it, it's just out there, and you can just take it and bring it back, and we can pass it around. Great. Thank you. Practicing the presence, what a great spiritual discipline. <clears throat> there is uh, children's uh, devotional uh, this morning after the praise block. And uh, what's that? Do you have an announcement? I just wanted to say there's a sign up for St. Patty's. Uh, sign up for St. Patty's uh, in, the, in the back. So uh, again, let's be covering that with prayer. One of the biggest events in Hoosick Falls in terms of the yearly calendar and uh, we want to redeem it for the Lord's sake. So uh, today uh, we are thinking about uh, baptism, and I will make mention uh, in the sermon how next week we're going to have a baptismal service, and if the Lord quickens to your heart a desire to be a part of that, uh, then I'd ask you to see me after the service, and I can explain how we can make that happen for next Sunday. There's uh, at least uh, three individuals, maybe four that I know of, uh, that are going to be baptized. But if there are others, um, please, please consider that. So our songs, uh, in terms of the opening praise block, because baptism is a wonderful drama of identifying uh, fully with Christ, um, our songs talk about our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ. And so um, be thinking about that as I move to, to the guitar. If you're able to rise to your feet, please stand with me as we sing our opening praise. Let's turn our hearts to the King.
It's who you are. It's who you are. 
bless you. We bless your holy name, God. You are Abba, Daddy King, and we bow our hearts before you, Father. We're amazed at your love. It is amazing grace that you've poured out upon us. Lord, that you would call us orphans. You would call us your sons and daughters. Oh, Lord, we praise you. Oh, God, we bless you. Father, thank you so much for loving us with an everlasting love. We come to you because of that love. We come to you to praise you, to magnify your holy name. Would you fill us afresh and anew by your Holy Spirit? Fill us with your spirit, Lord, and Spirit of God, bring that assurance, Lord, of the Father's love into the depth and core of our being that it would become the ground of our being, that we would understand that we are cherished, that we are loved, we are delighted in. May we understand our identity today in a greater and deeper way, Lord. May we understand that our identity is rooted in Jesus himself, Father. Let it be so in our lives that we would know Christ in his fullness, Lord. We bless you and we thank you and we praise you. Meet us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, uh, shake a hand or give a fist bump or elbow bump and greet one another in the name of Christ. Uh, there is children's, uh, children's message now. If you'd, uh, children would come forward uh, for the devotion. Thank you. Okay, my question to the children was, has anyone ever stayed up all night? Almost. Almost? You, have you stayed up late past your bedtime and been sleepy? Okay, yeah. So you know how that feels past 12 o'clock? Okay, wow. I don't think I stayed up that late when I was that age. The only, um, I worked um, at a job where I took care of moms and brand new babies, and it was lovely. But I worked at night, and so I have stayed up all night helping taking care of new moms and babies. And usually around 2 a.m., 2 to 4, I would get very sleepy, and I would have to um, drink some coffee to stay awake. So I, I know what it's like to stay up. But our verse today from the Bible, it's from Luke 6, 12. And here's the color sheet that you'll be able to work with later. Okay, Luke 12 says, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God, his Father. So none of us, none of you have stayed up all night. I've stayed up 
all night, but I was working and drank coffee. I can't imagine how Jesus could have stayed awake and prayed. But he did, and he set an example if he, and again, we've talked about Father, Son, Spirit, okay? If he, while he was in his body, um, needed to spend that kind of time with his Father, listening and talking with him, to stay close to him, to hear what he was telling him, and to know how to do what he was doing day by day, then that really is an example of how much we need to pray also. I have an artist's picture here of Jesus praying. And again, we don't know if Jesus looked like that. But this artist just put in, showed him. I'm sure that was during the night. You can see the moon in the picture that he was praying then, and he was sitting up. So um, he went to a mountainside. So he went out by himself. It wasn't like he was at a campfire with other people to help um, keep him awake, or he didn't have marshmallows, some sugar to help keep him. And prayer is, I wrote on the color sheet, it's speaking to God, it's listening. That's supposed to be an ear. It kind of doesn't look like one, but that's why I'm telling you what it is. And we're, we have an eye. You kind of are watching and listening. And the idea of God reaching down to us to help us. And also on this part, the praying, I have two hearts. Because just like if you talk with a friend and it's a good conversation, your hearts are together. You have a good connection. So praying is that heart-to-heart -heart connection with God and Jesus and the Father. We're doing that. Okay. So from Jesus' example and from what I have done through the years, I told you a few weeks ago, I came to Jesus first when I was five years old. And then when I understood about sin, I asked him to clean me off of my wrongdoing of being irritable, thinking mean thoughts, saying bad words. And I keep doing that through prayer. I keep getting cleaned off from the different things I do and to connect heart to heart, to hear him and to speak with him. So what I do is, here are some of my prayers. Here is one. This says, please help me. Sometimes it's just help. One time I was taking a walk and there was a dog who was barking and it was a Doberman. I don't know if any of you know what a Doberman breed of dog is, but they're a rather very protective, fierce dog. They love their people, but other people, they're, they're wanting to protect their territory. And this Doberman was barking and barking and barking at me. And so uh, I wondered if he was going to stay in his yard. And he came out, and he was coming at me, showing teeth. And so I did a very quick, help. I didn't even say please politely to the Lord. I said, help. And I actually saw a white shadow come down between me and the dog. This is the only time I have seen that. It was, that's how I describe it. Do you know how your shadow is? You see a shadow when you're in the sun and it's kind of a dark shadow. This was like a white shadow that came down between me and the dog and the dog stopped in his tracks. And he turned around and he went and I said, my next prayer that I say a lot, thank you. Thank you, God, for your protection from that dog, because I knew exactly who was protecting me. Why he, is there, a seed there is. That's from another sign. I use my paper. I recycle. Okay. So another thing that I do with thank yous are thank you, Lord, for soap and shampoo when I'm in the shower or bath. Thank you for food. I live in a spot where I see deer. I saw a deer very early this morning. I say thank you for your creation and your animals, for the beautiful sky. Another one I say is this one, is please forgive me and clean me, because I still need cleaning from that initial time of coming to Jesus and being clean from sin the first time. I still need please forgive me and clean me, because I still do things I shouldn't do, and I need his help for that heart-to-heart -heart connection. So I do this throughout the days. Here's another one I wanted to just tell you about. Here's a set of keys. I do that a lot. Um, I misplace things I have all of my life. And so one time, I had lost my keys in the snow. 
And I knew about where I dropped them, and I kept walking back and forth. Have you ever done that when you're looking for something? You just keep going back. And you probably don't lose things at your age, but I do. I forget where I put them. So there was nothing in the snow where I was looking. And finally, I remembered to say, Lord, would you please help me find my keys? I needed them. And I went back through where I had gone about five times, and there were the keys lying right on top of the snow. So again, I know who answered my prayer. Those keys had not been there the other four times. And I have found through my life lots of times when I ask for help, I get what I need. It may not always be what I ask for, but it is. Another thing, I'm, the last thing I'm going to share with you is some of my best praying, just a second, is when I'm in bed. Right first thing in the morning before I've done anything. And I feel like I'm in the arms of God and I start that heart to heart connection, and it's a great way to start. So I just want to let you know that when you come to Jesus and you start this relationship with Him, He is there and He is waiting and he is glad to talk with you heart to heart to listen and to help you and we're going to do that right now and then you can grab a color sheet over there thank you lord for each one of these children and we pray you talk to me later thank you for them and their lives and i pray for each one to come to know you to follow you to know you heart to heart and i pray for their families in raising them Thank you that we can be cleaned by you, that you can forgive us, and we can connect heart to heart. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, Lisa. <clears throat> Somebody want to look up uh, Acts 2 in the Pew Bibles? I forgot to um, look up and note the page reference. What? 9.10. Thank you. 9.10 in the Pew Bibles. You want to turn there. And if not, you want to turn to the book of Acts in your own scriptures. Thank you, children, for coming forward. And thank you, Lisa, for... That encouraging message on prayer. <clears throat> We're continuing our Inquiring Minds uh, series, and somebody asked a question on baptism, so I want to address that today. I uh, tell people all the time that there's a number of dramas in life that I like to watch, I like to observe. I love to go to weddings. Uh, it reminds me of my wedding, uh, promises and commitments that I've made uh, to Lois. Uh, so I love weddings. Um, I uh, don't want to say I necessarily love funerals, but funerals are a significant uh, event for me because it reminds me of the brevity of my life. Whether the person's, you know, uh, 70 or 80 or 90 years old, uh, I realize that their life has gone quickly. And uh, in, in my ministry, I do weddings. In, in my ministry, I do funerals. So I, I, uh, I, those are significant times. I also love baptisms. I just love baptisms. Uh, anybody else out there uh, join, join me in that? Yeah. Um, love baptisms. Uh, I just love to hear uh, folks' testimony about uh, what Jesus means to them. And uh, it reminds me of my baptism, uh, which was a very significant uh, event in my life. And uh, so next week we're going to do a baptism. And uh, this week I want to use as preparation uh, for that. So if you'd give your attention to the end of uh, the kind of the middle of uh, Acts chapter 2. The setting for this is uh, Pentecost. Jesus has died and been resurrected, spent 40 days uh, with his disciples, and he told them to tarry in Jerusalem to wait until the Holy Spirit was poured out, and uh, they've gone to the temple, and Peter has preached. And then we read these words, uh, starting in verse uh, 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, 
what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other uh, words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and they were added to that day about, were added that day about 3,000 souls. God, would you bless your word as we study it today? <clears throat> so we catch uh, this whole, um, this whole uh, drama uh, here in Acts 2 in, in the middle. And uh, it says that the, the hearers uh, of Peter were cut to the heart. Well, if we go backwards to verse 22 and 23, we see maybe why they were cut to the heart. Peter is preaching and he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So the Holy Spirit is working in the hearts and lives of these Jewish pilgrims who've come for, for Pentecost. It's one of the three travel feasts, one of the three feasts that God commanded able-bodied people to come to Jerusalem and be a part of. So they've come from all over and they hear Peter preach and he says, you've killed Messiah. And they're cut to their heart. They have this crushing realization that they've murdered God's Holy One. So they ask this question, what shall we do? And friends, we should ask that same question. Our sin sent Jesus to the cross. Your sin and my sin, as much as the sins of those who were living at the time of Jesus, our sin sent him to the cross. So in a sense, we murdered the Savior too, right? We bear responsibility. So we should ask the same question, what must we do? In light of the fact that we've killed Messiah, what must we do? And Peter says, first, you must repent. Now this word in the Greek text of our scripture, metaneo, you know the, the uh, uh, prefix meta, um, is to change. Think of metamorphic rock. Okay, that's rock that is one thing and then put under great pressure and heat and it becomes something else, right? Metamorphosis, right, is the changing of the, the, the larva into the butterfly. Goes into the cocoon, comes out, comes a worm-like thing going in, comes out a flying insect on the other side, right? Meta is a prefix of change. And uh, noeo, gnosis, is, is knowledge, is, is understanding, is, is the mind's thinking. So put those two together and you have a total change of mind. It's a change of heart. So, so repentance is understanding that we're going in one direction, serving ourselves, living for ourselves, absorbed with ourselves, and, and we have a 180 degree turn. We turn from that old way, selfish, broken way of living. We turn from that and we turn to God. Repentance, okay? It's, it's a powerful word that we have to consider today. Peter says, repent. So I ask the question now, what does godly repentance look like? So quickly, let's think about that. It means to be truly grieved over our sin. Second Corinthians, Paul says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Okay. So this is really sensing just how deeply you've offended God's holiness. And it moves you to grief, okay? So it's a heartfelt thing. It's not just this kind of casual mental assent. 
Isaiah, when he sensed his sin, he said, Woe is me for a lost, for a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In Isaiah 6, he sees the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. And the seraphs crying, Holy, holy. And Isaiah understands. He says, Woe is me. Again, not just... Just simple mental ascent. Oh yeah, I've, I've messed up. No, this is brokenness over sin. Now, we don't allow our emotions to rule us, but our emotions are part of who God created us to be and, and we should engage fully in terms of the act of repentance and allow our emotions to be engaged, okay? So we need to be grieved over our sin. We need to be willing to make amends in the story of uh, Zacchaeus that he says, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Okay? So Zacchaeus understood that he'd been living for himself. He'd been living sinfully. And he turns and embraces Jesus as Lord. And he says, Lord, in light of what I've done, I am going to make amends. We need to be willing to accept the consequences of our sin, to own our stuff. When Jesus is crucified in Luke's gospel, we have this interchange between the criminals, one on one side, one on the other. One of the criminals who hanged, railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, Okay, the, the, the repentant uh, criminal understood that he was dying because he had committed crimes. He embraced, he, he owned his stuff. So part of repentance is not entering into the blame game. Oh, well, if you hadn't said that or done that, then I wouldn't have gotten angry at you. Oh, if I hadn't had such a poor raising as a child, I would, I would have been a much better person, right? It's always this blame game. It goes way back to Genesis, right? You know, very first time sin entered the world, you know, God confronts Adam. And what does Adam say? Oh, this woman that you gave me. Don't, don't go into the blame game, friends, okay? You need to own your stuff. We need to be willing to seek transformation and a change of our ways, not just momentarily, but long term. Galatians says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Again, so repentance, godly repentance is not just like, oh, I've done bad. Lord, I'm going to acknowledge you. And then I go back to what I was, no. We don't go back to the stuff, okay? Even more graphically, uh, oops, whoa, what happened there? Let's back up, back it up. Sorry about that, I don't know what happened. Second Peter, there we go. For if they had escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them. That's the old way of living, the defilements of the world, the sinful way of living. The last state has become worse than the first, for it would have been better for they'd never known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. And here's the kind of graphic uh, word picture. What, what, what the true Proverbs says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow after washing herself returns to wallow in the mire. Okay. It's a harsh word picture, friends, but that's kind of human nature that we turn from our sin and wickedness. Oh, we're gonna embrace God. Oh, but I just kind of want to dabble still in the world. Never works. <laughs> like a dog returning to its own vomit. Now, I don't know if any of you are pet owners, but I've actually owned a pet and seen that happen. Gross as gross can be, okay? But that's the word picture of someone who doesn't fully commit to this repentance process. <clears throat> so, the hearers, initially of Peter's sermon, they're cut to the heart. They ask, what shall we do? And he says, 
you need to repent and be baptized. So let's think about baptism for a moment, can we, friends? <clears throat> baptism as a means to identify with Jesus, both his death that you go down under the water and his resurrection, you come up out of the water. In Romans 6, when it talks about baptism, it talks about counting yourself as dead to sin. So this word for counting yourself is this idea of consciously identifying with Jesus. It's what baptism is. It's a, it's a drama enacted to symbolize our complete identification with Christ. Now, baptism is an interesting word in terms of the, the words of our New Testament. Again, the New Testament was written in Greek uh, and then translated for us. And here's the Greek word for baptism, baptizo. And uh, as comparison, uh, pistis is the Greek word for faith, okay? Now, if we take the Greek letters of uh, the, the words, we have B-A-P-T-I-Z-O. It's kind of a Z, baptizo. It's got the kind of D in there. And then we have pistis, okay? So that's just taking the Greek letters and putting it into English so we can see it in letters that we recognize. Now, the translators of the New Testament most often will take a word and then find an English word that fits. But in the New Testament, the, the translators basically cheated, right? They transliterated the word. They did not translate the word. For example, pistis, when we see it appear in the text of the New Testament, we always see the English word faith. Because as they're going through the text of the New Testament and they're, okay, we want to take this from Greek and put it into English. They're like, okay, here's the word pistis. Well, our English word faith works really good. So, okay, we're going to use that word faith. But again, they didn't do that with baptism because there was no good English word to use. So again, they just kind of cheated, took the easy way out, and they just took the Greek letters and put them into English letters. And we have baptizo and baptism. Same, same thing, right? Sounds exactly the same. So what does this word mean? Well, <clears throat> the word baptism was used of dyeing fabric. You take a white t-shirt and you dunk it into purple dye and it comes out a purple shirt, right? You put it in, you kind of mix it around and, and the liquid of the dye, it gets into every nook and cranny of the fabric so that white comes out purple preached a message uh, years ago on baptism called the tie-dyed life. And the week ahead of preaching the message, I had tie-dyed a shirt. And uh, so, uh, hence the, uh, the graphic there to, to reference the message from years ago. But so, you baptizo uh, the shirt, okay? It's also used of uh, tempering steel. Uh, you can think of all the... Um, Knights in Shining Armor movies you've seen and, and the blacksmith is, is hammering out a piece of steel to make a sword for the knights, right? Well, next to the, to the, to the uh, blast furnace and the anvil where he's working, he has a vat of oil or, or water. And as he's working, he'll stick it into the, uh, into the liquid and it strengthens, it tempers the steel. He baptizos the sword, okay? baptizos the shirt. So it means immersion. And also uh, part of the background, I believe, of New Testament baptism is the Jewish rite of mikvah. This is ceremonial bathing. And you can see uh, an archeological dig that has a mikvah and how it, it resembles in many ways a modern day baptismal tank. And uh, next week we will uh, take this big cover off and, and reveal the baptismal tank that's built into this platform. Okay? And it has steps in it, just like the mikvah, and we fill it up with water. So what this rite uh, would, would be used as is that the Jewish worshipers, and I remember in my travels in the Holy Land and going to the Temple Mount, that before you got to the temple proper, there was a mikvah right on the grounds of the temple. And so the Jewish pilgrim who wanted to come and worship would, of course, clean themselves up at home. The purpose of the mikvah was not to get the grime off your body, okay? You did that at home as a Jewish pilgrim. 
But you did that at home. You cleansed yourself, in a sense, taking the bath. But then, before you went to worship, you went into the ceremonial waters to remind yourself that I need to be cleansed before I come into the presence of the Almighty. So that's the mikvah. They had strict rules about how this was done. And one of the most important aspects was that you need to have, quote, the Talmud says, living water. You needed to have a source of running water, okay? Could not be stagnant. And scripture actually speaks a lot about living water. Let's just look at this very quickly. Jeremiah, my people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, one, the spring of living water, and two, they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water, okay? So God is the source of true living water. And he's taking his people to task because they're settling for second best. They're digging their own cisterns, their own sources of water. Friends, look to God in your life for the living water. There's no substitute. There's no substitute. Jeremiah again says this, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they've forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Yahweh, all capital O Lord, his proper name, Yahweh, Jehovah, is the source of living water. John, Jesus references this. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that you ask for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you what? Living water. This is Jesus with the woman at the well. He goes on to say, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can I get this living water? Jesus says, I am the living water. Jesus is the living water. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of what living water will flow from within him. And finally, revelation for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to what? Springs of living water. God will wipe away every tear from their eye. So the idea of uh, ceremonial bathing, of cleansing in living water, an interesting, interesting aspect of some of these uh, archaeological finds in terms of these ancient mikvahs is uh, here on the left-hand side, you see uh, that there's, there's uh, even two entrances to the mikvah, one for going into the water, quote-unquote dirty, and then you are ceremonially clean, and then you come out the other clean, right? Go in dirty, come out clean. And then here, and I saw a mikvah, uh, again, in my journeys in the Holy Land, the steps have this ridge running up them. And, and the Jewish worshiper would go down one side, come up the other. And so as we think of baptism, that they go in, and all the baptismal candidates, I've uh, encouraged, you know, you gotta clean up at home. <laughs> they go in dirty, and they come out clean, right? Because the waters represent Jesus. And Jesus is the one who cleanses us from our sin. Okay, uh, so we need to repent and be baptized. And then, and let's look at this again in the text of scripture, uh, verse 38. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whenever I have opportunity to uh, prepare a baptismal candidate for, uh, for baptism, I encourage them to come expectantly. Okay? Come expectantly. When I was baptized as an adult, God moved in my life in such a powerful way. And, and here in Acts 2, Peter links baptism and the move of the Holy Spirit. But is it just for those who first heard? No, verse 39 goes on to say, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are what? Far off. That's you and me, friends. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is talking to us today. 
And that if we pursue Jesus in baptism, we can expect that the Holy Spirit power will come. What a great thing, friends. So how do we make application of this? Well, first we need to repent. We need to turn from our sins and embrace Jesus as Lord. And friend, if you have never given your heart to Christ, I want to just challenge you right in this moment, right here and right now, to give your heart to Jesus. Give your heart to Jesus. Okay? It's as easy as ABC. Ask, believe, and claim. I'm going to ask for forgiveness for my sins. I recognize I've been going the wrong way, and I repent. I turn from that, and I turn to Christ. I ask for forgiveness for my sins. B, I believe. I believe that Jesus is the answer to my sin sickness. I believe that Jesus, when he died on the cross, took my sins upon himself so that I would not suffer the penalty of my brokenness. And see, I claim new life in Jesus. John chapter 1 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the gift of becoming children of God, even those who believed in his name. I claim my adoption in Jesus. I claim, Father, be my daddy God. Be Abba to me. Because I come to you in Jesus' name. So the first application of Acts 2 is follow the instructions of Peter. He is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he was not speaking just to those who first heard him. It's for all who follow, all who are far off. That's us. Repent. And then we need to totally identify with Jesus, his death and his resurrection. Okay? Luke 9, 23, I've quoted for you recently. But he was saying to them all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Maybe that was the Lenten lunch. Maybe it wasn't from the pulpit. I know I've quoted it from the pulpit before. It was last week, though. Yeah, it was Lenten lunch. Total identification, right? Jesus had a cross. We're going to have a cross. Jesus went to Calvary and died. We're going to go to our own Calvary and die. Total identification. But again, the beautiful drama, you go under the water, that's like being buried with Christ. Christ was buried in the earth for three days, but after three days, he rose again from the dead. And up comes the baptismal candidate. Total identification with his death and with his resurrection. What a beautiful drama. It is so gorgeous, friends. So full of meaning. Question arises, uh, what if I was baptized before as an infant or maybe years ago? Let me share with you my own testimony. My father was an Episcopal priest, and when I was a little, 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 little baby, he baptized me. And I appreciate that. As I grew and came to faith myself, I appreciated that my, my dad wanted to do that for me. But as I studied scripture for myself in college, I came to an understanding that I I believe baptism is meant for believers. Circumcision was a rite of the Old Testament when a baby, a male baby, was circumcised on the eighth day. And it was a sign of covenant inclusion. And I, I understand that. But I see the New Testament teaching about believers being baptized. So I was baptized as an infant, and as I studied Scripture in college as a young man, my heart was drawn that I wanted to be baptized. And so I approached my dad and said, hey, Dad, you know, I'm thinking about being baptized. He said, well, why don't you just give testimony to your faith, okay, because you were already baptized. So I struggled with that. I really did. I struggled. And I came out deciding on the other end of the struggle that I just needed to honor my dad in that. I didn't get baptized at the time. 
My dad got cancer and he died. I've talked about that, praying for healing and he getting healed in the ultimate sense. Jesus brought him to himself. <clears throat> but after he passed, I felt like I had the freedom then to pursue my convictions. And so when I was at seminary, I was part of an alliance church and we met in a, in a, a YMCA and we met in the aerobics room, this big kind of wooden floor gymnasium kind of space. But attached to the YMCA was a full, full-size full pool. So my pastor said, we're going to have a baptism service. I'm like, oh, I want to be a part of that. So I spoke with him and he kind of coached me through it. There's someone else who was going to be baptized that day. And then a family emergency came up and they w- weren't able to show up for the service. So it was just me. I gave my testimony in the service. And after the service was done, <clears throat> and then we went poolside and I got baptized. So <clears throat> what if you've been baptized before as an infant? Uh, my encouragement is, is that uh, study the scriptures for yourself. But I believe as you study the scriptures, uh, you'd come to a similar conclusion that I did is that, that baptism is for believers. And, and I, again, appreciate the, 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 the spectrum of Christendom that, that baptizes infants. You know, I, I think I understand theologically where they're coming from. Uh, but the examples we have in the New Testament is uh, believer's baptism by immersion. So what also if you've been baptized before and, and, and maybe you're in a new place in your walk with God. So for me, the verse of scriptures that especially uh, touches on this is from the book of Ephesians, where Paul says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. And then here, verse five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So people, when they ask me this question in terms of being baptized again, here Paul talks about one baptism. And as I've studied this passage, uh, I believe that Paul is talking about one reality that's embraced. I don't believe it's necessary saying that, that, you know, just once baptized, that's it. Okay. So I think there's a place for one, those who've been baptized as infants to then get baptized later in their life, living example, standing in front of you. <clears throat> and also for someone who's been baptized, maybe, maybe you were baptized at you know, 15 years old and maybe you, you know, had a time where you didn't walk as closely later in your teens or early 20s or something and you've come back to faith and you're at this new place of commitment to the Lord. I, I think, again, in my parsing of this, I wanna be a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth as I try to divide the word of God here in Ephesians when it says one baptism. Again, I, it's my conviction that it's one reality that's embraced. And I think there's a time and place for somebody who's come into a deeper experience in their walk with God that they might, even though they've been baptized, even at the time, maybe as a believer, that they want to be baptized again. Now, I say to baptismal candidates as I go through all this with them, you know, if somebody's coming every single time I have a baptism saying, I want to be baptized again, you know, I'd maybe caution them, uh, you know. But I think there's, there's a place for that, friends. So I want to speak to you about next week, okay? One, if you've never been baptized, uh, again, look, look at the text of Scripture. Verse 38, look at verse 38, chapter 2. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, just the really serious ones of you. Is that what it says? No. Repent and be baptized, Who? Every one of you, okay? Baptism is for everyone. It's not for the spiritual elite, okay? It's not for only the really holy ones out there. No, it's for everyone, okay? So if you've never been baptized, I would ask you, pray about that. Talk with me after the service if you're interested, okay? If you've been baptized as an infant and you've never been baptized as an adult, again, I can break down the other pertinent scriptures for you, but I believe I can make a very cogent case that it would 
be good for you as a Jesus follower to be baptized as a believer. And if you've been baptized years and years ago and you're at a deeper place in your life, again, I just want to verbalize. It's my, my conviction that it might be right and appropriate if the Spirit is leading you to be baptized again. <clears throat> we got to close here. Why do we get baptized? Well, last week, you know, we were asking the question, you know, why do we do something? Fast and pray? Because Jesus tells us to, right? Same thing this week, friends. Why do we get baptized? Because Jesus gives us an example to, and he explicitly commands us to. Amen? Matthew 28 is known as the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me here on heaven and earth. Go therefore into all the world, making disciples, doing what? And baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, after Jesus had said that, Matthew 28, here in Acts 2, he says, repent, and every one of you be baptized. It's not optional. It's a command. Jesus gives us an example again. He was baptized himself. He had no sin in his life. Eh? But he said to John, when John bulked, you know, like, oh, you should be baptized. And he said, no, just for all things to be proper. A beautiful identification of Jesus with the Father. You know, for us, it's our identification with Jesus. And it's just this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful opportunity to live out the drama. And I want to switch gears now. In the Alliance Church, we speak of two ordinances that we embrace, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Again, we believe that these are direct commands from the Lord. Jesus commanded us to be ones who baptized and get baptized, but also in terms of this meal, he commanded us, whenever you do this, do this in what? Remembrance of me. And so I would argue that uh, communion is also about identification, right? That we identify the body represented, the bread representing the body of Christ, the cup representing the blood of Christ, but also our identification with Christ in terms of the body, that we're going to be the hands and the feet of the Savior. In terms of the blood, that we are going to willingly be a sacrifice unto the Almighty, the Father, by how we live, by how we praise, what we think, what we say, what we do. So this is a, a, a precious day, friends, for us to consider both of the ordinances of our faith. Both baptism, we look at anticipatorily to next week, but in the here and now, we have opportunity to embrace the bread, to drink from the cup, to honor Jesus by so doing. I asked before, let me plead and beg now. Friend, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, take these moments to reach out in prayer, in the quietness of your heart, to reach out in prayer and to look to Jesus to be your Savior. That's the soul, the single the only requirement for participating in the communion meal. You don't have to be a member of our church or of any church. You just have to have Jesus in your heart as Lord and Master. So if you satisfy that requirement, then this is for you. But if not, friend, pass by the communion elements. You don't want to eat the bread and drink from the cup 
if you've not given your heart to Christ. Because Paul teaches in Corinthians that if we do so, we bring judgment upon ourselves. Simple solution. Just give your heart to Jesus. I plead with you by the mercies of God. Be reconciled. So I want to pray and use this prayer to, to prepare our hearts. And then after I pray, if you want to come forward and receive the elements, bring them back for yourself and or your family. If you have offering, uh, you can uh, bring that with you. First offering yourself. And then on communion Sundays, we have not only our typical offering uh, uh, plates, but the basket on the table is for the benevolent offering. That is a separate giving that you would do that would fuel the, uh, the blessing of those in need in our fellowship. The benevolent fund is used to, to meet physical need in the body. So let's bow our heads, turn to God in prayer. Almighty Lord, we are so grateful that as your spirit inspired Peter to speak that Pentecost morning, that he said that the promise was not only for those who heard him, but for those who were far off. And that the promise of the spirit was not just for them on Pentecost day, but it's for us now. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, sweet Spirit of God, would you come and minister deeply to our hearts? God, would you, would you bring comfort and goodness and transformation to us as we identify with Jesus, Father, in this communion meal? Would you give us fresh insight to the bread and to the cup. Would you bring great meaning, Lord, to our our eating of the bread and and our drinking of the cup. And Lord, I pray you would, even as we share this ordinance, Lord, communion, that you would be speaking to many hearts about next week in the baptism service. And that people would embrace both, Lord. The communion now and the baptism next week. Lord, work in hearts. Bring that about. We love you so. We love you so much, Lord. Use this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to come forward now, friends.
one of the most spiritually enriching uh, studies I've made in my lifetime, decades now of being a Jesus follower, has been to uh, dig deep into the Passover and the Seder Supper that is part of that feast. <clears throat> in the Gospels, it says when Jesus gathered his friends for the Passover that it was after supper that he took bread and broke it and gave thanks for it. <clears throat> and within the Seder uh, meal, that bread is referred to as the Afikoman. And the Jewish tradition, the understanding is, is that the taste of the bread after the meal, it's like dessert, that taste should linger with the worshiper. So Jesus took bread after supper, it was the Afrikaman. Not just a fleeting experience, friend, but, but a lasting remembrance. As we eat together this morning, I want us to think about this lingering with us into the week ahead. This becoming a bedrock reality for Monday morning and Wednesday afternoon and Friday evening. And in the week ahead, we will think about having been gathered around the Lord's table this morning in this moment and having embraced Jesus, his body broken for us, that we would be made whole, that that would linger, it would stay, it would stick to us. Jim said that Howard's making a baked oatmeal. Always heard of oatmeal and it sticks to your ribs. What a great breakfast, it sticks to your... Let this, friends, let this stick to your ribs. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the bread that we hold in our hands. For all that it symbolizes that Jesus came and allowed his body to be broken so that we might be made whole. Minister, Lord, your wholeness to us in the week ahead. May this bread stick to our ribs as it were, Lord. May we take this forward, may it linger with us throughout the experience of our week. We love you. We're humbled, Lord, that you set such a table for us, that you give us your son. We embrace Jesus now in his name. Amen. Let us eat together. Once again, the Gospels make clear that it's after supper that Jesus takes a cup and blesses it and gives it to his disciples. Within the context of the Seder meal, that cup is known as the cup of redemption. Do you understand, friend, that you need redeeming? Do you understand that you can't redeem yourself? And it's only by looking to Jesus that you can be reconciled back to the Father. He took a cup and he gave thanks over it and he said to his closest friends, this is the new covenant in my blood. We totally identify with Jesus in baptism, his death and his resurrection. And we totally identify with Jesus in communion, his death and his resurrection. Because here we hold the symbol of his death, his shed blood for us. But we're also mindful that there is a feast that will be celebrated with wine someday soon. It's the Lamb's Supper in heaven. And Jesus is going to be there because he's not dead. 
his death and his resurrection. We identify with Christ fully. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the cup that we hold and all that it means to us, Lord. That Jesus shed his blood that we would be cleansed from our sin. Like going into the waters of baptism, Lord, we, we come out like Christ. We embrace the cup, Lord. We drink deeply from the cup today. The cup of redemption, Lord. We need redeemed. We can't redeem ourselves, God. It's only through Jesus. Minister your grace to us, Lord, as we, as we sip deeply from this truth. We love you. We give ourselves to you wholly. We do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink together. These uh, last two songs, for me, are two of my favorite songs of total surrender. And as I think about totally identifying with Jesus, I do think of Luke 9.23 and the call to die to self. take up our cross and follow Christ so I just encourage you to use these last two songs as prayers and make that prayer of yieldedness and total surrender friend you'll never never regret coming to that place of full commitment to Christ Holy Fire
more time, Holy Fire.
Lord, it is our deep desire that you would have your way in us. That you would fully reign, Lord, you would rule and overrule in all the affairs of our life. We bow our hearts and we bend our knee before your kingly authority in our lives right now, Lord. We embrace Jesus, Father, as our Savior. We embrace his death and we embrace his resurrection, Lord. New and eternal life, Lord, we embrace that right now. May we live out of these realities in the days ahead. Lord, would you bless this week? And we pray for the service next week, Lord, as we come and see this drama enacted before us, Lord, as as dear folk enter the waters of baptism, Lord, as they are saturated in, in the waters of Christ, Lord, that we all who observe that might be refreshed and renewed in our own reality of being saturated in Christ. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. We commit our ways to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. God bless you as you go, and if you're able to stay for fellowship, friends, join us.